we are trying to make the point in this paper that most anomalies uh, in the cross-section fail to replicate. In particular, we replicate the bulk of the published anomalous literature with in total 447 variables. Uh, we control for microcaps by using NYC breakpoints and value-weighted returns. So basically, for each of the 447 anomaly variables, uh, we form deciles using NYC breakpoints, and we calculate value-weighted portfolio returns. Uh, we calculate high minus low average return. If that average return is significant, that the traditional T cutoff of 1.96, and we view that as a replication success. Otherwise, it's a replication failure. And uh, we are not uh, taking into account the multi-testing uh, multi aspect uh, in our baseline case. So in total, it turns out that 286 out of 447 anomalies fail to replicate. In other words, 64% of the anomalies uh, fail to replicate. And this is why we argue most anomalies fail to replicate. And in particular, if we impose uh, what the uh, Harvey, Liu, and Zhu paper um, have been advocating for multi-testing adjustment for uh, you, by using a T cutoff value of three, it turns out 85% of the anomalies fail to replicate. Uh, in particular, um, in addition, uh, even for replicated anomalies, their economic magnitude is much weaker than originally reported um, in the original studies. And, um, and, and our result is not driven by our extended sample. Uh, we repeated all our replication tests in the original studies. Uh, in, uh, in original samples, in original studies used by original authors, it turns out our replication results are quantitatively similar. Uh, if anything, slightly higher uh, failure rates have been uh, documented. Uh, due to the time constraint, I'm going to go straight to what we do in this paper. I'm going to skip the motivation. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, what, uh, what, what we define as replication procedures, and I'm going to walk you through our long list of 447 anomalies, and then, then report the replication results. We emphasize NYC breakpoints and evaluated returns, and in the paper, we report other procedures as well. Uh, we coalesce around the pharma French as well uh, in this paper by emphasizing the danger of, uh, of microcaps. Um, they are in their 2008 Journal Finance paper, uh, they document that the microcaps are so abundant, account for 60% of names floating around, but only 3% of total market cap. And uh, we updated the, their evidence in terms of the going forward, standing the end of our sample, which is 2014, only 1.4% of total market cap. Um, uh, it's accounted for by microcaps. So this is really a tiny corner of the market uh, place. We're not talking about small firms. We're talking about tiny firms. There are many ways uh, to overweight microcaps, and microcaps have highest average uh, equal weighted returns, uh, largest cross sectional dispersions in returns as well as anomaly variables. So, if oftentimes uh, when we use NYC, Amex, or NASDAQ breakpoints, or what we call all breakpoints bundled with equal weighted returns, your extreme deciles are going to be uh, populated by at least 60% of the market caps. 60% uh, of the uh, stocks are going to be market caps in extreme uh, deciles, and you get overweighted that way. Uh, hundreds of papers have been using cross-sectional regressions uh, by imposing a linear functional form. And because OLS is minimizing sums of uh, uh, residual squares, and that nonlinear function and end, end up being um, regression slopes end up being very sensitive to outliers. Uh, those are most likely uh, belonging to microcaps. Micro so in other words, cross-sectional regressions overweight microcaps even more. Now, what is uh, replication? So uh, in the paper, we followed the bulk of the replication literature in economics. In particular, Daniel Hammamesh had an influential paper, 2007, Canadian Journal of Economics. Uh, he distinguished pure replication, or the scientific literature calls uh, reproduction, which is to, to do something again in exactly the same way. That's not what we are doing. Uh, we are doing what then calls scientific replication. That is different sample, different population, similar, but perhaps not identical model. Uh, in fact, we are using different sample, 
as well as the same samples in the original studies. We are using the same population, which is Chris Compustat, but we are using similar but not identical models. And the thing argues that uh, why this is um, more suited in type to our methods of research, because at the end of the day, most of us are doing observation of signs. Um, I understand that a big portion of our profession is doing ex experimental economics, but most of us, uh, we don't get to uh, run, ex uh, run experiments and collect our data, which uh, it's probably a good thing. Um, I then argues that uh, uh, because of observational uh, nature of our uh, economic sciences, uh, we need to emphasize scientific replication to evaluate the reliability of the body of scientific evidence that we thought we knew. And see also the May 2017 issue of AER. Uh, last year, they published, uh, AER published eight um, papers in that issue on uh, basically progress reports on different fields of economics, on replication, labor, developmental, and we are all using the same definition of replication. All right, 447 anomalies. So we group them into six categories. Uh, momentum value, uh, investment, profitability, intangibles, and trading frictions. So I'm not going to go through every single uh, one line carefully. So momentum category, we have 57 variables, including the classic earnings surprise, uh, price momentum, industry momentum, as well as somewhat uh, obscure um, like the 84, 1984 Financial Analyst Journal uh, article that, uh, that uses analyst forecast change. It turns out to be a very powerful predictor, uh, much more powerful than earnings surprise. Uh, we also use somewhat the newer, uh, newly discovered momentum variables, including 52-week high, uh, segment momentum, customer momentum, uh, supply and customer industry momentum. Uh, value versus growth category, we have 68 variables, including the classic, of course, um, uh, book to market, and uh, a very nice AQR paper, as Ness Frizzini talking about using more updated uh, market uh, information to form. Uh, value versus growth variables, we use, uh, we follow their insight as well. This includes a book to current book equity. We also include a lot of uh, monthly sorted value minus growth variables uh, based on quarterly accounting uh, data. So that's why we have so many. Net payout the yield, five year sales growth uh, from the Conishock Schleif and Vishini, enterprise multiple operating cash flow. Um, accounting literature, intrinsic value to market, uh, different versions of it, uh, equity duration. Investment uh, category, we have 38, including not only the real investment, uh, but also uh, Jay Reader's uh, influential work, um, net stock issues, uh, equity issues, a uh, composite, and, uh, and Kent's earlier work with uh, Sheridan, uh, composite equity issues. Uh, inventory, uh, operating cash flow, Richard Sloan's early, very influential work, and total accruals, as well as different components of total accruals and discretion and percent accruals. Profitability, so uh, 78 of them, return on equity, different versions, uh, annual version, monthly version, uh, ROE, ROA, uh, DuPont analysis, profit margin, you can decompose ROA into uh, leverage, book uh, profit margin, asset turnover, uh, Pharma French um, version uh, operating profitability and the Raybo and the co-authors have been talking about the cash-based uh, operating profitability. Piotrowski's uh, fundamental uh, score, failure probability at financial distress, basically a uh, profitability with a negative sign in front of it. Um, intangibles, 103 of them. So organizational capital, advertisement, R&D, um, price delay, uh, financing constraints, different versions, a highly influential literature in accounting on accrual quality and earnings quality and different aspects of earnings quality. Um, a dispersion of analyst forecasts, a very nice paper by Heston and Sotka documenting pretty exotic looking seasonality variables. Uh, we managed to replicate them all and none of the factor models can do anything about them. This is a really, really cool paper. Uh, trading frictions, the last category has uh, in total 102 variables, including most of the what we traditionally call liquidity and frictions variables, uh, different versions of uh, volatility, idiosyncratic volatility, total volatility, systematic, 
uh, volatility and uh, market beta and different versions of the GAN, short-term reversal, short -term over, dollar trading volume, zero trading days, and maximum daily return, total skewness, uh, tail risk, uh, liquidity beta, and different versions of liquidity beta and bid ask spread. All right. Took a while to put the data library together, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> Do I still have time yet? Okay, good. All right. Um, uh, replication results. So, uh, despite our, uh, in our view, pretty lenient uh, hurdle of uh, a T cutoff of 1.96, uh, in total 286 anomalies are insignificant, or 64%. If we impose uh, Kim Harvey and co authors higher T cutoff value of 3, that's 85%. Across different categories, um, it turns out the trading frictions liquidity, liquidity category is the ha it's hit the heaviest. It turns out 93% of them uh, turned out to be uh, not showing up. Um, so our interpretation is that if you use a reliable set of uh, empirical procedures, it turns out the most anomalies never existed to begin with. An alternative interpretation is that anomalies existed but traded away once publicized. So um, this is not exactly what we see in our, uh, in our results. We repeat uh, all our replication tests in the original samples used by original uh, authors in the, in the original um, published papers. And it turns out 293 anomalies are insignificant, or 66%, um, uh, at the p-value of a traditional level of 5%. Um, hurdle, and we impose T cutoff of three, it turns out 86.6% uh, fail to replicate. And again, and the liquidity, the trading frictions category, and 91% of them fail to uh, show up. So to evaluate uh, to what extent using equal weighting and all breakpoints, actually mostly equal weighting, uh, can inflate, quote unquote, inflate the magnitude of anomalies. Uh, so on this slide, we report the all breakpoints and equal weighted returns. So uh, it turns out if you do the replication tests in this way, this is like in the setting of portfolio sorts, this is most generous to microcaps. It turns out still 40% of the uh, anomalies fail to replicate. And, uh, 54% with a higher T cut of value of three. So even with equal weights, uh, we still see 61% of the trading frictions, uh, liquidity uh, variables uh, fail, fail, fail to replicate. And on average, if we look at the high minus low average um, return spread magnitude of that, it turns out the average inflation rate is 42% vis-a-vis our uh, benchmark procedure on NYSE breakpoint and uh, value-weighted returns, ranging from 27% to 56%. All right, so before we start to go through specific papers, um, Kawei and I uh, always like to uh, acknowledge at this point, both Kawei's name and my name showed up in our table three which report anomalies that fail to be replicated. So both of, both of us think we, are, um, we have reported the false uh, positive uh, results before. So this is much of a, a self-critique as well. Um, all right, so in the momentum uh, category, so standardized unexpected earnings, uh, with six months holding period, we are, we are documenting 19 basis points per month, uh, but in change of conditional account shock, and they reported 1.13% per month with equal weights. Um, so tax expense surprise, which is tax expense momentum, we are looking at uh, 28 basis points per month, and Thomas and Zhang reported 1.3% per month uh, with the equal weights. So value versus growth, a famous paper, this highly influential paper, uh, Lacona Shock Life and Vision report 0.61% uh, per month with equal weights, and we have 20%, uh, 20 basis points. So net, uh, net debt, uh, we are looking at uh, 31 basis points per month, uh, which is not small, but nothing to write home about. Um, uh, in, in, in Penman, Riches, and Tuna, they reported 73 basis points per month. So investment category, um, total accrual, so we only get to 23 basis points per month, and he said 1.6, uh, but in a highly influential paper, um, Richard Sensler and Solomon Tuna, they reported 1.11% per month. Uh, with all breakpoints, equal weights, they also use size-adjusted 
uh, returns, but that the size benchmark portfolios, that's how it's evaluated. But the adjusted returns at the firm level and are, are equal weighted instead. The same procedure was also used uh, in the 96 uh, Sloan Accounting Review paper. And then um, and, um, and, um, NSF st stands for external finance and net external finance and net equity finance. So we are looking at 27 basis points per month. And uh, the original article reported 1.29% per month. Uh, uh, profitability, failure probability, we're getting to only 38 basis points per month, and this that's 1.3. Um, not a small, but, uh, but, uh, but with a small T stat, but the original paper reported 81 basis points per month with a different sample period. And O score, we are getting zero. Z score zero as well. Uh, but the original paper reported 1.18% um, per month with uh, somewhat of a un un unconventional procedure. Okay. Um, dispersion, uh, intangible category, uh, the famous paper, uh, dispersion and its forecast, uh, 79 basis points per month. We're only getting 24 basis points, and he said below one. Uh, corporate governance, I should mention, we come cl close in replicating uh, composition metrics original number in their sample period. It turns out this is a case in which extending sample actually killed the uh, significance. But overall, 30 variables switch from uh, significant to insignificant. But on the other hand, 37 other variables switch the opposite way. So we end up concluding overall, from the meta science perspective, sampling variation uh, plays a relatively uh, limited role in our overall conclusion. Accrual quality, we're getting zero. Mm. Uh, idiosyncratic volatility. So we looked at uh, 16 different versions uh, defining um, volatilities different ways. Uh, we 15 out of 16 measures are insignificant. But the original article reported about 1% per month, and this that's about 3. It turns out in this case, all breakpoints versus NYSE breakpoints are the key difference. Uh, we are all using valuated returns. In fact, we use, uh, in the paper, we also reported all breakpoints and equal weighted returns, and those numbers are even smaller than, than valuated return. So we end up concluding uh, that the low volatility anomaly, it's not reliable. Uh, traditional liquidity variables, uh, turnover, dollar trading volume, one over share price, zero trading days, absolute return, price impact, absolute return to volume, and uh, net debt, and uh, even short-term reversal, we're only looking at 26 basis points per month, this, that's 1.93, uh, and also different uh, uh, versions of uh, Charlie Peterson, liquidity variables, liquidity betas, uh, they're uh, they are not replicated. Uh, if we impose T value of three, 100 percent of them uh, fail to stand up. All right, and then we were scratching our ha heads and we couldn't figure out uh, what exactly is the difference. And uh, we, as noted, we also um, uh, reported the equal weighted results. Are still, 61 percent of the um, variables uh, fail to replicate. And then we. Uh, we, we read the original literature very carefully, and turns out that most papers use cross-sectional regressions. Um, and even when portfolio sorts are being used, only, 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 only uh, equal-weighted uh, numbers are reported. Oh, I should, be, I, I should try to be fair. Uh, Jürgen Dish, uh, we have a vote of respect uh, for him. So the short-term reversal, we're only looking at the 26 basis points per month, and in, the, in his original sample period, that, that number is 66 basis points per month, and his that is 2.5. So, so short-term reversal is a case of uh, um, uh, uh, being weakened by extended sample. Uh, replicated anomalies, their economic magnitude is actually much smaller than previously reported. So momentum abnormal returns around the earnings announcements, uh, 98 versus 30, and I should mention that uh, Momentum variable, the classical momentum variable, is the best performing variable uh, in our exercise, 1.1 versus 0.82% uh, per, per month. And uh, um, investment to asset or asset growth, uh, both the Q-factor model and uh, uh, occasionally known as the five-factor model, uh, we are both 
building on the on the on, on investment to assets, and we are looking at the 46 basis points per month. But the original paper reported the 1.05 using different uh, uh, breakpoints are using equal weighted returns as well. Operating accruals 27 basis points versus 87. I'm ready to conclude. So in this paper, we replicate the bulk of the anomalous literature within total 447 uh, variables we control for microcaps by uh, using NYC breakpoints and evaluated returns. Uh, we documented uh, in total 286 anomalies or 64% uh, uh, of the anomalies are not uh, uh, significant or fail to replicate, and uh, if we impose t cutoff value of 3, 80, that's 85% of them. So even for replicated anomalies, the economic magnitude is much weaker than originally reported uh, in the original studies. So, and our result is not driven, overall is not, overall conclusion is not driven by uh, our extended sample, and because in the original sample, the results are quantitatively similar. Uh, we end up concluding uh, capital markets are more efficient than previously reported. 